This video was made possible by Storyblocks. This is a list that grades the most orderly streets in 100 cities around the world, on a scale of 0 to 1, with 1 denoting the perfect street grid. Now, as you can see, Chicago has the highest score of all, at 0.899, exhibiting the closest approximation of a single perfect grid. Which makes sense, I mean, it literally looks like an electronic circuit, with perfectly straight lines. But while Chicago may be leading the pack, American cities as a whole dominate in the grid ranking with Miami and Minneapolis coming in second and third place. But what's interesting is that if we compare this list to a list of the world's 10 most livable cities in 2021, you won't find a single match. And that's because what makes these cities more livable is their exceedingly low score on the grid scale. Of course, there are many methodologies to evaluate what constitutes a livable city and therefore many different lists. Whichever index you employ though, this is a pattern that seemingly persists. Cities with a high quality of life don't have a rigid grid design. Now, you might say, these livability indices are a function of many parameters and the statement I just made is based on a simple correlation. Saying that a grid design makes the city less livable is the same as saying that a pirate shortage caused global warming, just because they are correlated. Yes, this is a real correlation, here it is. But anyway, you may have a point. Correlation does not always mean causation. So, is this simple negative correlation enough to raise some food for thought and compel us to ask the big question? Are cities with an urban grid actually worse? Well, I'd say so. Now, the reason why grid designs have gained such popularity in especially the United States is because of what happened in the 19th and early 20th centuries. See, it was at that time that large migratory waves, mainly from Europe, made their way to the US and the planners, in anticipation of the future population growth and the consequent dense settlement of the cities, needed a simple and repetitive system to demarcate the land boundaries that would also be able to efficiently accommodate future subdivisions. And the grid plan was perfect for this job. It was intuitive, easy to implement and efficient. The grid provided a template on which property developers could coordinate the demarcation choices of their property boundaries and it thus minimized the possibility of land disputes, whilst maximizing the value of land. So for a time, it looked like the grid plan and land development were a match made in heaven. It's simple, efficient, makes sense from an economic perspective, and it facilitates land development. Everything seems to check out. So how could such a system possibly be problematic? Well, I'll tell you about that in just a bit, but first, I need to tell you about the sponsor of this video. Storyblocks. With a subscription to Storyblocks, you can download unlimited clips in high resolution that are royalty free for both personal and commercial use. I literally use Storyblocks footage in all my videos, so when they contacted me about this sponsorship, it was a no brainer. I mean, it's amazing. They have an extensive library of footage, After Effects templates, music, images, sound effects, and more, which they are constantly optimizing and adding to, to give you everything you need to bring your stories to life. You can choose from a number of plans that work for you, from their selection of flexible subscriptions that give you all the content and tools you need to focus on creating. Every creator really should have a Storyblocks membership. So go to storyblocks.com forward slash OBF or click the link in the description and sign up today. Thank you again to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. Alright, so why did grid designs become problematic? Well, cars. You see, most of the urban grids were laid out before the advent of the automobile, and then this guy, Henry Ford, figured out how to mass produce affordable cars and everything turned upside down. When Model T's started crowding the streets in the 20s, the very elements that had been the grid's strengths, its uniformity and its simplicity, suddenly became its biggest flaws. When all the streets in a city are basically the same, this means that every street is as accommodating to cars as the next one. But the thing is, that not all streets are created equal. Some act as main arteries, critical for the circulation in a city, and some are just auxiliary. And not taking this into account makes for some pretty bad traffic management. The inability to distinguish between streets able to accommodate high speeds and residential streets led to a huge increase in traffic accidents. To make matters worse, a structural property of the grid is the high frequency of intersections which also happen to be the most accident prone points on a street. Very soon, the urban planners became aware of the problem and started promoting more car-friendly urban designs. Despite this shift, however, the problem still appears to persist as a number of studies conducted in the past 25 years have found the grid to be the least safe street pattern. A famous urbanist summarized the problem in a tough but elegant manner. 
Quote, the new grid iron plants were spectacular in their inefficiency and waste, by usually failing to discriminate sufficiently between main arteries and residential streets. The first were not made wide enough, while the second were usually too wide for purely neighborhood functions. The problems with the grid don't stop at traffic though. See, if you're an urban planner with the noble ambition of designing an environmentally resilient city, a grid plan might just make your task a bit harder. To begin with, its rigidity means that it's very inflexible to the topographic idiosyncrasies of the terrain leading to a disruption of the natural land features. Or, in less pretentious language, to build an urban grid, you basically have to flatten everything that stands in its way. Another problem is that grids usually come with a higher ratio of paved surfaces, meaning more cement and asphalt, and therefore less permeability and water retention capacity, which is a recipe for potential rainwater management problems. An additional culprit regarding the connection of the grid design with environmental hazards has been suggested in a recent paper by a group of researchers who found that cities with a grid design tend to retain more heat than non-linear ones. They suggest that this effect arises from the fact that the perpendicular streets of the grid disrupt the airflow and consequently trap heat. This effect alone, the team found, causes an estimated $400 million in excess costs for air conditioning in the state of Florida. Okay, so we've addressed how the urban grid might lead to some traffic management problems and its environmental sustainability is, to say at least, questionable. And this leaves us with the elephant in the room the looks of it. As shocking as it may sound, the grid design has been criticized as monotonous and repetitive, a quote, banal characteristic of American cities, you might say. And sure, arguments based on objective evaluations such as taste are always on shaky foundations, and yes, there are exceptions like the Manhattan and San Francisco grids that are iconic for their unique looks. But there is a point to be made here. The blandness of the grid creates an anti-aesthetic urban environment which is very likely linked with adverse effects on mental health. So yeah, it doesn't really sound good for the grid. Inefficient traffic management, environmentally questionable and boring. But not everything is bleak. We saw that the grid emerged exactly because it was an efficient and economically beneficial spatial arrangement for the cities. And to most of the arguments we proposed against it, there is a counter-argument. For example, a recent paper has shown that the high interconnectedness of the roads, a structural trait of the grid, might actually be contributing to the reduction of the car's GHG emissions. This won't be too relevant a few decades into the future though, due to EVs dominating the car fleet, but it's still worth mentioning. And with the chaotic urban sprawl that we see many cities devolving into today, there are more and more voices appearing who call for a return to the simplicity and interconnectedness of the grid. So yes, the grid is far from perfect and it comes with many inherent problems, but with some smart and out of the box planning, policymakers could leverage its benefits and minimize its downsides. Just look at Barcelona and how it managed to turn its grid into a brilliant infrastructure, supporting and promoting a vibrant and environmentally sustainable urban lifestyle. The point is that no situation is black and white. In every argument there are two sides, and if the grid plan can be adapted to be able to meet the modern challenges, the future of urban development appears bright. But that's it for this video, if you liked it, please consider subscribing. I've noticed that a lot of my viewers seem to forget to subscribe, so if you like my videos, it's a surefire way to make sure you don't miss any in the future. Future. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.